The Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell pretrial motions continue to trickle in. The prosecution has rested their case, and now the defense begins in the Alec Murdoch case. Did the prosecution prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt? That's right. Alec Baldwin scores a big win in New Mexico. Have I told you that evil exists in the world? Yes, I have. Let me show you what she looks like. That's right. She. And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. Good day, everyone. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. You know the drill. Subscribe if you haven't. Like if you do. Leave me a comment and hit that little bell for notifications. And remember, you can listen to us anytime on any of your favorite podcasting apps. Just simply type in Crime Talk. Well, first of all, I want to thank everyone for noticing that, well, that I wasn't around last week. We, we had comments saying, is Scott okay? Where's Scott? I even had a couple people email me, and I had a few more call the office to make sure I was okay. That was very, very nice of all of you. I tried to respond. If somebody said, where's Scott? Is he okay? Scott was okay. He was in trial last week. I was in trial all last week, and um, I just didn't have time to do a show every day. We were literally in trial every day. Had to be there at the courthouse by about 8.15. We were there usually until after 5, and then there was work to be done for the following day. So, it was a first degree murder case. So although I would prefer to do a show, I had to focus my energies on what was really important at that time. So I hope you understand. And with my busy trial schedule coming up over the next several months, there may be a few more weeks where I am not available. I assure you, I would rather be here. So what do you have to do to make sure that happens? That's right, subscribe, share it with your friends. Let's get Scott a bazillion uh, subscribers so that he can quit his day job. Am I asking too much? I don't think I'm asking too much. Please go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up for a background subscription service. You'll be happy you did. If there's anyone out there you were ever curious about what was in their background, now is the time to do it. If you're going to get involved with somebody, now is the time to do it. When you go to crimetalksearch.com, you put in the name, literally millions of public records are searched and a report is generated. And it's going to give you a report. If they have multiple social media accounts, you're going to find it. If they have multiple phone numbers, multiple email addresses, it's going to be found. And more importantly, you're going to get information regarding criminal history. Hopefully the person you're searching has none whatsoever, but if it's there, it's going to be found. You're going to get everything you'd want to know, whether you're going into business or whether you're going into a personal relationship, you're going to be able to find out the information you want to know. So go to crimetalksearch.com, sign up today. You'll be happy you did. All right, let's go ahead and begin with today's docket. First on the docket, that's right, the Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell motions continue to trickle in. The prosecution has filed their response to the defense objection to dismiss the indictment and basically sanctions for some discovery violations. Well, you may ask, what are the discovery violations now? I mean, we've only had three years and here we are just what, um, March, April, we're about 45 days out from trial and the state is still testing evidence. I just don't get it, ladies and gentlemen, why it has taken so long. So let's go ahead and take a brief look at the motion uh, filed by the uh, people in this case. And they say, hey, back in late December of 2022, some state lab personnel uh, notified the prosecution team that during the stipulated testing process, additional hairs were removed from the testing sample, which might have potential exculpatory value, right? Exculpatory evidence is evidence that reduces the uh, criminal liability to a defendant. Maybe not completely, but maybe a little bit. However, the state lab had limited ability to test this evidence and was unable to retrieve any usable DNA evidence. Defense counsel was immediately notified, according to the prosecution, and based on the timeline of the additional hair collection, the state collected and secured a private lab which could test such items on an expedited basis. 
And then on January 25th of 2023, the parties entered into a new stipulation regarding the consumptive testing of such items by the private lab. Remember, consumptive testing is testing where there will not be enough of the sample remaining so that the defense can do their own investigation that's going to take place or retesting. Anyway, back uh, during that time period of January 2023, the prosecution team found papers reflecting tips collected from the public back in 2019 and 2020 during the search for J.J. Vallow and Tylee Ryan that had not been copied and provided to either the state or the defense. While various reports had been made and disclosed to the defense about the relevant tips investigated, not all of the tips had been disclosed. The individual slips of paper for the public tips in the possession of the Rexburg Police Department was provided to the defense on February 8th, 2023. And the papers from the Rexburg Police Department totaled 1,188 pages, including a 92-page document summarizing the tips in list form and the individual tip sheets. And then on August 9th of 2021, the defendant was advised the existence of electronic devices seized during a January 3rd, 2020 search of the defendant's home. Counsel were notified of the contents of the electronic devices, as well as the electronic devices were available for inspection and copying pursuant to the Idaho Criminal Rules 16B4. All reports on the seizures of these items were dis multiple disclosures reminded the defendants that these are items were available for review. At this point, neither the defense has requested nor attempted to make any arrangements to review the devices or the contents. What are those devices? It's Chad Daybell's son's iPad. Not going to be of any significance whatsoever. All right. Then the tips. Now the prosecution says, hey, you know, they're not in our possession and we didn't know about it. So no harm, no foul. It really is it really going to come down to anything unless there's some sort of exculpatory evidence that the real killer may have called in and confessed? Probably not. Should the prosecution have gone back to the Rexburg Police Department and say, please search all files so that we don't have this embarrassing situation two months before trial? Yes. Okay. The testing on the DNA samples, the hair samples, th the prosecution has filed a motion or disclosure of new discovery. What did they do? They retained a private lab. It's called Bodhi Laboratory. Familiar with them. Had them as a expert retained to do some weird testing. In that particular case, I had the prosecution did it. Super expensive. But for the most part, as far as I know, there's no real basis to challenge uh, their techniques. It's just a private lab and they can move much faster than anybody else. In particular, Bodhi Laboratory says that, hey, we can test DNA. You know, we usually like to have six weeks, but guess what? We can do it in as little as two days. So that's the rush job, and I'm sure it's super, super expensive. But the prosecution has turned over about 120 pages from Bodhi Laboratories, according to the most recent disclosures in the uh, most recent filing in the Lori Vallow, Chad Daybell matters. Like I said, they like six weeks, but they got the four week pricing, two week pricing, one week pricing, and the one to two day rapid DNA service. You gotta love that in your DNA lab. I wonder if the state should maybe put some pricing incentives and they could charge the various jurisdictions based upon the amount of uh, quickness that they needed in that they could have it uh, turned over. All right, do I think that the court is going to dismiss the indictment against Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell on that case? Absolutely not. No way is the judge going to do that. What is the remedy for discovery violations? The prosecution usually doesn't get to use it. Maybe you can't call a witness. Dismissal of an indictment for something along those lines is, well, it's an extreme remedy and uh, no judge is going to do it. Heck, I think the defense had a much greater argument as it relates to the speedy trial uh, argument that the defense made on behalf of uh, Lori Vallow, but the judge denied that one as well. Frankly, that was a much better argument in which to ask for the dismissal or as they keep doing in Lori Vallow's case now asking that, you know, dismiss the uh, death penalty possible punishment. Not going to happen. So sleep tight. Hopefully this trial is going to go forward in April like it's scheduled to do for 10 weeks. 
Not sure why it's going to take that long, but we'll have to wait and see. And maybe Judge Boyce will decide to say, hey, you know what? I've seen all these other high profile trials all over the country that have been televised and there's not a media circus when you have a strong judge that doesn't let anyone get away with squat. Somehow I don't think they're going to do that. Why? Because the prosecution doesn't want it televised. Why the prosecution doesn't want it televised? I have no idea. I just don't get it. All right. Speaking of high profile cases, Alec Murdoch, Friday afternoon, the prosecution rested their case. The defense called one witness and they will resume again tomorrow since today is President's Day. So although the evidence against Mr. Alec Murdoch looks a little suspicious, you know, we've got that 16 minute window for the alleged killing that the state has theorized. Is that enough time for Mr. Murdoch to kill his wife and son, change out and uh, change out of his clothing, hide the blood spattered clothing and uh, hide the weapons in a place where law enforcement is never going to find them? That is the big question. Let me know in the comments whether you think he has proven the case. So let's take a quick stroll down memory lane. So after 18 days of testimony and 61 prosecution witnesses, Alec Murdoch's defense attorneys conceded late Friday that the accused double murder had likely lied when he denied being at the family's estate's dog's kennel minutes before his wife and son were killed. The state has proven at most that he was at the kennels at 8.44 p.m., according to the argument of Jim Griffin, who made his motion for judgment of acquittal pursuant to Rule 29 to Judge Clifton Newman when he asked for the court to grant that motion. He said that the case against Murdoch was uh, uh, supposed and there was a lot of lack of evidence. And remember, a motion for judgment of acquittal is a almost routine, not so much required anymore at the end of the prosecution's case, but you always make the argument. But understand, it has the same legal standard basically as a preliminary hearing. Once again, the court must view the evidence in the light most favorable to the prosecution, drawing all inferences in their favor, and the judge should not substitute his judgment for that of a 13th juror. And unless, unless, basically, he concludes that not even a reasonable juror could conclude that Mr. Murdoch uh, was responsible for the death of his wife and son. So we all know that was going to be denied, and so did the defense. So when the judge denied it, um, as the court stated, the evidence to support a guilty plea. And if a jury believes it, he said, then the jury could obviously conclude that um, Mr. Murdoch was guilty. Now, the evidence includes not just a crucial timeline that shows Mr. Murdoch repeatedly uh, being less than candid to law enforcement and others about being near the dog kennel, that he always said that he wasn't there shortly before 9 p.m. on June 7th, 2021. That's, uh, that's going to be big. And let me tell you, if, if the defendant lies or the jury believes that they are lying, they're going to punish the defendant. Just saying. Anyway, now prosecutors have presented other evidence over the last uh, several weeks that they say demonstrates clearly that Mr. Murdoch was at a breaking point that caused him to ultimately snap and kill his wife, Maggie, and his son, Paul. Now, on the night of Murdoch's wife and son, in which they uh, were killed, the uh, attorney faced imminent exposure that he had embezzled nearly $9 million from his law firm as well as others. He was millions of dollars in debt to the Palmetto State Bank and was under great pressure from Paul and Maggie to stop his opioid addiction. And then we heard from numerous prosecution witnesses uh, that disclosed that, obviously, to the jury. Now, the lead state prosecutor, Creighton Waters, told the judge that the state proved that Murdoch summoned Maggie and Paul to the family estate the night of their deaths, despite Alec Murdoch's denials that he did so, and he used the family weapons and ammunition to kill them, according to the prosecution. Now, Paul was killed with a shotgun, Maggie with an assault rifle, and both of them were shot at a very close range. And the prosecution alleges that since it was at such a close range, that there would have been spattering on Alec Murdoch's clothes with blood, and now the clothes are missing. It's according to the prosecution. Now, both firearms are missing. And to the state, that is a mountain of evidence, which means Mr. Murdoch is, in fact, guilty. But 
to the defense, absence a direct witness or a video showing the killings, that means there is reasonable doubt that Mr. Murdoch killed his wife and son. The murderer would have blood on his or her clothing. The murderer would have murder weapons, is what Mr. Murdoch's defense attorneys told the court in his failed bid to get the state's case thrown out. Now, the trial will resume at 9.30 on Tuesday when the defense continues presenting evidence in the case. Defense attorneys expect to take at least five to seven days to present their case. Um, I hope for the defense side, it goes a little better than some of their cross-examinations, which opened up a bunch of doors that allowed in a bunch of really bad stuff like all the thefts and the roadside shooting. Yeah, I hope they I hope they do a little better than they did on that. Anyway, so let's recap. Obviously, the now once prominent uh, lawyer of the uh, very uh, respected low country legal family has maintained that on the night of the murders that he was napping in the house there at Moselle, the uh, Murdoch's 1700 acre uh, state there in rural rural, rural Colton County. Easy for me to say. He then left the estate without going to the dog kennels, according to him, to drive to his ailing mother's house. And that's his story, and he's sticking to it. The key piece of evidence that disproves that claim is a 58-second video found on Paul's cell phone. The video shows Paul's arms as he grappled with a dog, as Murdaugh and Maggie are heard encouraging the dog in the background. Although Murdoch is not seen in the video, at least half a dozen witnesses identified the voices on the video coming from Paul, Maggie, and Alec Murdoch. The video alone and other evidence such as Murdoch summoning his wife and child to the property may be enough for the jury to conclude that Murdoch is the killer, despite the defense claims that they need more proof, that more proof should be required or needed. Now, through one of the uh, prosecution's final witnesses was the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division agent, Peter Rudosky. Now, the prosecution has offered the world a microscope and intimate look at June 7th of 2021. And under questioning, the agent served up a timeline consisting of cell phone records, text messages, and location data on Paul, Maggie, and Paul and Alec Murdoch's phones. In addition, the agent told the jury about recently discovered location data on Murdoch's Chevrolet Suburban provided during the trial by General Motors, showing the exact time the car speeds from when he left Moselle to drive to his parents' home and then ultimately return to the property. Now, highlights from the agent's testimony basically states that at 7.39 p.m., Paul takes a Snapchat video of his father attempting to straighten a, a tree on the property. In the video, Murdoch is wearing light-colored slacks and a blue shirt. Those now missing clothes Murdoch likely wore when killing his wife and son, is what the prosecutors are alleging. And then at around 8 p.m., Maggie arrives at the property. She and Paul ate a meal of country fried steak, macaroni, and cheese prepared by their housekeeper, Blanca Turbiati Simpson, who had left for the day. Now, it's unclear whether Murdoch ate with his wife and son. And then around 8.30 p.m., Maggie and Paul went to the kennels located about um, 100 yards from the house. At 8.40 p.m., Paul had a four-minute phone conversation with his friend, Rogan Gibson. Then at 8.49 p.m., Paul and Maggie's phone both locked for the last time that night. Texts to them, texts to them went unanswered. And about that time, Paul was killed by two shotgun blasts to his chest and his head. Maggie's leg, chest, and skull were pierced repeatedly by at least four and possibly five shots from a 300 blackout assault rifle, according to the prosecutors. Then at 9.02 p.m., after being offline from approximately 6.52 p.m. to 9.04 p.m., Murdoch's phone was active. At 9.04, he tried to call Maggie. His 2021 Chevrolet Suburban's OnStar navigation system recorded that the car was moving away from Moselle at 9.07 p.m. when he tried to call Maggie again. After leaving Moselle, the vehicle slowed as he passed a place where Maggie's cell phone would be found the next day. Hmm. 
He drove an average of 52 miles per hour and made several phone calls along the way. At 9.22 p.m., the Suburban was put into park at his mother's home in Almeida, where her caretaker testified that she saw Mr. Murdoch, who stayed for approximately 20 minutes. Upon arriving and being for entering the house, Murdoch drove his vehicle back to the wooded area for a minute. This was according to the OnStar data. Prosecutors have implied that he might have hidden the murder weapons during this time, but they can't prove it. Now, the prosecutors also acknowledge they did not search that wooded area. You'd think they would do that. Anyway, at 9.47 p.m., Murdoch texts Maggie, call me, babe, 9.51. During Murdoch's drive to the Almeida community and back, Murdoch's OnStar location data showed him driving at speeds of up to 80 miles per hour. At 10.06 p.m., Murdoch arrives back at Moselle and goes to the house. At 10.06 p.m., he drives to the house, stays a few minutes, and then drives to the dog kennels. He finds his wife and son lying dead there, illuminated by the lights in his car. Within 20 seconds, he calls 911 to report the killings. Now, apart from the timeline, prosecutors have presented various other information and witnesses over the last four weeks. The jury has been presented with more than 400 exhibits thus far. Nine witnesses, including Murdoch's best friend, Chris Wilson, uh, testified about Murdoch's numerous financial frauds committed over the last 12 years, frauds in which he stole more than at least $8 million from his friends and his law partners, his clients, and his own brother, Randy, a lawyer at the family firm that uh, has basically no longer exists or has been restructured. Now, those frauds were about to be exposed, and prosecutors contend that Murdoch killed his wife and son to gain sympathy and to delay legal actions that were brought about to expose his hidden life of thefts. Not only was Murdoch desperately trying to embezzle more money in the months leading up to the June 7th, 2021 killings, prosecutors say he was also millions of dollars in debt, and testimony was presented that he was repeatedly overdrawn at his account at the Palmetto State Bank by hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, shortly before the killings, Murdoch contacted Palmetto State Bank asking for another $600,000 loans. Two witnesses who worked for the Murdoch family, Michelle Shelley Smith and Miss Turbiate Simpson, testified that Murdoch came to them after the killings and seemed to try to persuade them to modify their previous statements to SLED, the South Carolina law enforcement investigation people, about various times of his actions. Now, Smith was a caregiver for Murdoch's ailing mother, testified that he wanted her to say he was at the Almeida house for more than 20 minutes when Murdoch was only actually there for about the 20 minutes. Turbiate Simpson also testified Maggie was uh, had been telling her that she was worried about a lawsuit in which Murdoch was a defendant. The de plaintiffs were seeking $30 million, money the family just simply did not have. And Maggie's sister, Marion Proctor, testified that Paul was called the little detective because he found out about his father's addiction to prescription drugs and was telling Maggie about his findings. A month before the killings, on May 6th in 2020 and 2021, Paul sent a message to Murdoch. Mom found several bags of pills in your computer bag. In the audio played to the jury on September 13th of 2021, confessions to sled agents, Murdoch is heard saying that he, for years, had a $50,000 a week illegal drug habit in which he used a man by the name of Curtis Eddie Smith to buy drugs from the Colton County drug gang members. But prosecutors have also made key mistakes that may play into claims made by the defense version that the case was fatally flawed. In one such mistake, SLED agent David Owen admitted telling a Colton County grand jury when seeking murder indictments that the agents had the blood spattered shirt Murdoch wore that night of the killing. This was the garment whose DNA from the victims who were you know, allegedly shot at a very close range when they would prove that Murdoch was in fact the killer. But under cross-examination, by the defense attorney, Mr. Owen admitted that the test done by SLED's lab found no DNA on the shirt. Well, that's a pretty big misrepresentation to the grand jury. Remember, if the jury thinks you lied, they're going to punish you. Anyway, the prosecution's case has also rested on a lot of forensic evidence that the jury will be expected to go back and decipher. 
Investigators have testified about a meticulous investigation where the evidence led them with absolute certainty to only one person. That's right. Guess who? Alec Murdoch. Were there any other credible leads that you investigated that led you to anybody other than Alex Murdoch? Mr. Waters asked. Not credible, no sir, Mr. Owens replied. But the promised landslide of forensic evidence that Water teased in his opening statement really hasn't appeared to connect with at least me. I don't know what the jury is doing. Now, the most compelling forensic evidence linking Murdoch to the murders is evidence of what the prosecution does not have. The prosecution has convincingly argued that a missing AR-15 style rifle designed to fire 300 blackout rounds, a replacement for a similar rifle stolen from Paul Murdoch's truck at Halloween back in 2017, was the weapon that killed Maggie. Now, sled forensic experts match the 300 blackout shells recovered near Maggie's body to several recovered from a shoot house on the property and a flower bed near the house where Paul test fired his guns. Now, sled agent Jeff Croft said he had worked on no other investigation where a 300 blackout was the murder weapon. Absence of blood on Murdoch's white t-shirt and green shorts has also become evidence of Murdoch's numerous murderous schemes. After establishing that both Paul and Maggie were apparently covered in their own blood, prosecutors offered one of the first dramatic moments of the trial when he examined the Colton County Sheriff's Department detective Laura Rutland about Murdoch's appearance the night of the killings. Is the individual in this courtroom who told you he tried to take the pulse of Maggie and Paul? Is the individual in the courtroom who told you he tried to turn Paul over? The individual you describe as clean from head to toe in the courtroom. The witness responded, yes, he is, Miss Rutland said. The jury did not hear that until the trial started. The prosecution appeared poised to argue that the t-shirt was speckled in spray of blood, invisible to the human eye that came from the gunshot wound. Then video evidence and the testimony has also revealed that Murdoch's clothes changed throughout the evening. In the Snapchat video recorded at 739, Murdoch wears a blue Columbia brand shirt and khakis. Smith testified that Murdoch was wearing Sperry style boat shoes when he visited his mother's house around 920 p.m. The shoes recovered from Murdoch at the crime scene were bright colored orange and yellow sneakers. Now the housekeeper, Miss Turbiante Simpson, who did the family's laundry, testified that she never saw either the shirt or the boat shoes after June 7th. But many other aspects of the forensic evidence have fallen short. The defense has obviously portrayed the investigation as being flawed in its evidence collection practices and blind focus on Mr. Murdoch. Defense attorneys have relentlessly grilled investigators about how they collected evidence the night of the murders as rain poured down on the crime scene with water from an overhanging roof dripping on Paul's body. The tire tracks were not preserved. The scene was not properly secured. Investigators left b bloody footprints near Paul and walked over sandal impressions that likely belonged to Maggie. A blue raincoat with evidence of gunshot residue that Waters highlighted in his opening statement was less than conclusive. No DNA links to Murdoch was found on the raincoat and Smith, the witness who supposedly saw Murdoch carrying the jacket, admitted that she could have seen him carrying a tarp. Then we had the revelation on Wednesday that Owen was less than candid uh, to the uh, grand jury about finding other guns with the same combination of buck and birdshot that killed Paul, along with other myths truths, was kind of a blow to the credibility of the prosecution's presentation in its last days of the case. Now, people do make mistakes, do they not? Mr. Griffin asked shortly after a uh, brief exchange. People do make mistakes, yes, sir, Mr. Owen replied. The trial resumes tomorrow. The defense is in their case in chief. Remember, the defense never has to call any witnesses. The defense never has to prove anything. The defense never has to prove their innocence but they are taking on that burden. So we will see how things come out. And remember, a good juror is not going to make a decision until they hear all of the evidence and then wait to listen for the, uh, the rules that they need to follow in the jury instructions. It's gonna get interesting, ladies and gentlemen. Let me know if you think the prosecution has uh, proven their case 
even though we're supposed to wait, you can let me know. All right, next on the docket, Baldwin wins big in New Mexico. That's right, the Santa Fe County District Attorney um, has got to be a little embarrassed today, dropping a uh, charge against Mr. Alec Baldwin. That means that even if he is convicted, there's no mandatory prison time. The district attorney dismissed the gun enhancement charge in the case after Baldwin's lawyer filed a motion alleging that the prosecutors were wrong f because the law did not apply. Baldwin obviously had been charged with the involuntary manslaughter count in the death of Helena Hutchins, and the DA initially tacked on the gun enhancement charge, which is basically using the gun to commit a crime. The problem is that at the time of the shooting, the New Mexico law provided a gun enhancement charge that could only apply if the gun was brandished, meaning the gun was displayed with the intent to intimidate or injure a person. Clearly that didn't happen here in the Baldwin case, and the DA felt Baldwin could be charged with a recent gun enhancement doesn't require brandishing. The problem was that was not the law in effect at the time of the shooting. If the gun enhancement charge stuck, then Baldwin, if he was convicted, he would have faced a minimum of five years in prison. Now, since that's gone, he, even if convicted of the involuntary manslaughter, uh, faces up to 18 months in prison and uh, obviously could receive uh, probation. The district attorney also uh, dropped the enhancement charge against the armorer, Hannah Gutierrez Reed. Now, the DA should be a little embarrassed she had over a year to do her investigation, think about the charges that she was going to go forward on. You think, you know, she would have maybe read the statute? You know, you know the defense guy did. Anyway, did she think the defense team for Alec Baldwin wouldn't go back and look at the effective date regarding that change in the statute? Yeah. I don't know, prosecution not off to a strong start. All right, I have told you several times, evil exists in the world. Let me show you what it looks like. Let me show you what she looks like. That's right, she. So an Alaska woman has pled guilty to killing her best friend after a man she met online said that he would pay her $9 million if she sent him photos and videos of her committing a homicide. Denali Bremer pled guilty Wednesday to first-degree murder in the June 2019 death of Cynthia Hoffman. Now, Hoffman was only 19 when she died from a gunshot wound to the back of the head. And the court records state that her body was dumped in the Exultuna River about 27 miles northeast of Anchorage, Alaska. Now, the Anchorage District Attorney's Office had previously said that Ms. Bremer, who was 18 at the time of the crime, started planning the murder after a man she met online told her that he would give her money in exchange for evidence of her killing someone. Bremer knew the man as Tyler and had begun a relationship with him, but authorities say that he had catfished her and created a fake person as a millionaire from Kansas. His real name is Darren Schilmer from Indiana. Now, court records state that Bremer and Schilmer started planning several crimes in exchange for money, including the sexual assault and the murder of someone in Alaska. And according to authorities, Bremer chose Hoffman as the victim and recruited four other friends, Caden McIntosh, Caleb Leland, and two other unnamed juveniles to help her. Bremer told them they would get a substantial share of the money for helping to cause the death of Ms. Hoffman. Authorities said that Bremer and two of the teens tricked Hoffman into coming to Thunderbird Falls under the guise of a hiking trip. They bound her hands, feet, and mouth with duct tape, shot her, and dumped her body in the river, according to the court documents. Now, as the crime was being committed, Bremer sent photos and videos to Schilmer, and after killing Hoffman, the group destroyed some of her personal belongings and texted her parents that they had dropped her off at a park. Police said there was no evidence Hoffman had been sexually assaulted. Thank goodness. Now, Bremer was arrested in 2019 and indicted on charges of first-degree murder, first-degree conspiracy to commit murder, first-degree solicitation of murder, and tampering with physical evidence, and two charges of second-degree murder. Following her guilty plea to first-degree murder, the Alaska Department of Law dismissed the other charges, and she is scheduled to be sentenced in August and faces anywhere between 30 to 99 years in prison. 
I'm kind of going for the 99, just saying. Uh, Schilmer was arrested, indicted on five murder counts. Um, according to records, McIntosh and Leland were indicted on four murder counts, according to the same court records. Uh, McIntosh was also indicted on tampering with evidence, and all three have pled not guilty, and they're waiting their trial. Now, here's the evil part. Hoffman's family previously said that they believe she was targeted because she had a learning disability that put her at a younger developmental age than her 19 years. Yeah, 99 years, I think, sounds about right. Just saying. Anyway, on to our dumb criminal of the day. Our dumb criminals angered that a couple in the neighboring apartment was making too much noise when they were engaging in uh, sexual relationships. Um, that's right. A pair of gun-toting sisters allegedly threatened to shoot the loud lovebirds, according to the arrest affidavits. Arrest affidavits for felony assault. Now, police busted Alexis Davis and Treasure Bibbs following a confrontation early Monday at an apartment complex in Houston. It's alleged that Davids and Bibbs, according to the police, there was an ongoing dispute over noise emanating from the nearby apartment that had already resulted in Davis and Bibbs leaving notes on the couple's door threatening to do harm to them. The uh, couple that was making all the noise, Kevin Frank and Kira McPherson, uh, also had children in the apartment as well. Now, during their encounter on February 13th at the Worthington Developments, uh, Davis and Bibbs both allegedly brandished a firearm and threatened to harm Frank and McPherson with a gun for being too noisy. Davis and Bibbs were arrested for aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, which carries a maximum penalty of 20 years in prison. Bibbs was freed on custody after posting $15,000 bond. Davis uh, remains locked up in the Harris County Jail in lieu of paying a $200,000 bond since she was already facing a a trial in a prior felony case for which she was free on a $10,000 bond. Okay, ladies, let me give you some advice, okay? And I would give this advice to lots of clients, Um, even clients that, uh, you know, maybe were in trial, right? Let it go. Let it go. Really, you're giving up your freedom because they're being too noisy, okay? I get it, you don't like to call the police. Maybe it's not your thing to do. But guess what? That's the thing to do. You call the police. You don't go over there and threaten somebody with a firearm. You just don't do it. Let it go. I'm telling you. There's one advice I could give to clients. 99% of the time I ask them, why won't you just let it go. And they have no explanation other than they had to prove that they were right. Let it go. All right. Thanks for sticking it out with me. Thanks for being concerned. I was gone all week. I'll try not to let that happen again. I appreciate each and every one of you. Have a wonderful day. Not just a great day. We'll see you next time on Crime Talk. 